Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate your ovation, I appreciate the greeting. Makes it feel that it's important what I am doing, and it is important. Because we must learn what hate and prejudice and indifference leads to. If we're not going to learn, history has a way of repeating itself. And we wanna, don't want to see that happen. I was born in Poland, in the city of Łódź, a huge industrial city. When the, in 1939, before the Nazis came in, I was 13 years old. And my life was as normal as any children any place else. We had, Lodz is a big city. We had schools, all levels, from kindergarten to professional schools, with many libraries. We didn't have television, of course, but we belonged to different youth groups, and we had radios, and we had hopes for the future. We had dreams. I always dreamt to be a teacher and to write books. I accomplished both the hard way. And the topic of my books is not the topic that I ever imagined in my wildest nightmares. Before the Nazis came in, life was, there was anti-Semitism in Poland. And uh, I wouldn't say there was no hate, there was hate. But somehow you uh, learned to live with it. And when you planned, life will change to peaceful, whereas things will become bad. When the Nazis came in, I learned how hate could be taught and how people who were your best friends could become monsters because of power. When the Nazis came in, they ordered everybody who has Jewish blood. By Jewish blood, they meant if you had an ancestor that was a Jew, that means you have Jewish blood. And as a Jew, you had to go into the ghetto and put down the star of David, a yellow cloth with the word you on it. Jew. They also proclaimed that anyone who has German blood, German ancestors, is now a Volksdeutsche, a German outside of Germany. And as a Volksdeutsche, they were given the power of life in dead above their best friends and neighbors. You remember Mrs. Gruber? To me, she was my grandma. Harry, the grandson, was my best friend. <coughs> and suddenly, we used to celebrate our holidays together. She wasn't Jewish. And most of us in that area, we came together, were Jewish. And we would celebrate our holidays, our pains and happiness as families. Now Mrs. Gruber remembered that she had German ancestors. And she was given the power of life and death over us, the families that she loved and protected. It didn't take a long time. And she turned her ten months to a sweet lady that was ready with advice and slowly to all the people. She was the lead lady. 
what she told everybody is her child. And she took wagons, loaded them with the belongings of her best friends and neighbors, and took them out. She had to move away from the area with the king ghetto. So she loaded those wagons and took it away to the nicest section of the city of Lodz. And at one point, I remember when I talk about it, I say everything. She came in and took from the house whatever she could and stood there on his shoulder, she had fur coats. I had an uncle that lived in the area that was outside the ghetto. And he had to leave at gunpoint. But when he left, he wasn't furry. When he left, he came with some fur coats to our house and said, we're going to try to escape before the ghetto lock was becoming locked up. And he took those fur coats and told my mother, when I come back, not if I come back, but when I come back, when we return, I want to be able to start a business again. He never came back. He and his family came back. And Mrs. Gruber, who was a busybody, she knew what was happening in everybody's house, what they have in every cabinet, no secrets for her. She knew what those fur coats were. She went right to the closet, put them over her shoulder, and started marching around, marching out. And my mother said, Mrs. Gruber, God will punish you for what you're doing for your Jewish friends and neighbors, what you're doing to them. And Mrs. Gruber calmly turned around and said, Naha, I could have killed you for those words. She could have. She had the power. And then she says, Naha, God is with us. God is with us. And she walked away. My mother just stood there and cried. And this is the scene that I will never forget. And my mother had said, a welt mit Menschen wird nicht schweigen. It's a world full of people who will not be silent. She still believed in justice. And things would change and become human. Now this was the best friend, the, the grandma, the lady that we trusted. That's what I mean by giving power. People get power. And they become masters. They forget what, what they're supposed to be and what's happening to them. Harry, the grandson, came one day to the ghetto before the ghetto was locked in, and dressed in the uniform of the brown uniform of the Hitler Youth. He had blue eyes and blonde hair, with a nightstick in his hand. He looked like a poster boy for the Hitler Youth. And I looked at him, that's my best friend. And from his mouth came the same ugly words we heard on the radio all day long. Jews are parasites, Jews are responsible for the evil of the world. We have to kill the Jews. And I just looked at him, my best friend. He grew up in our house. He was part of our family. And I said, Harry, how can you speak like that? And he spoke in Yiddish, not in German or Polish, in Yiddish. How can you speak like that? I think he was ashamed only for a moment. And then he said, now I am a German. And I have to do what is good for Germany. It took him three months. Three months 
to be brainwashed and they taught him to want to kill his best friends because somebody said their blood is as good as his blood. And it's scary when I think of that because I saw how people could be brainwashed and hate could be taught. And it scares me even more that now that I live in a free country and I appreciate freedom. You have to lose it in order to know what you had. Now in a free country are those who tell me that I'm a liar. They're called Holocaust deniers. I knew that they existed. I'm sure you came across some material, some literature, some programs. But I had once a phone call with somebody introducing himself as a historian. He gave me a name which I'm sure wasn't his name. And he said, I'm a historian. And uh, I have your book in my hand. I thought he wants to do interview for some reason or another. So he said, did you write the case? I said, yes. Can you assure me that everything in that book is true? I said, absolutely. Every word, every event, every date, every name, everything is true. And it's about my family, about my friends, about the events that were happening to us. And he listened very politely. So I started telling him about Auschwitz, in the other camps, in about to life where the survivors rose from the ashes, literally rose from the ashes, to start a new life. And he listened, I even talked about the Holocaust lady, discuss the children and the grandchildren and other great-grandchildren uh, carry on, pass down to their discuss. He was a gentleman politely listening and suddenly he started screaming, you are a liar, there was no Holocaust, there was no Auschwitz, there were no guest chambers, you are a liar. If he wanted to get me angry, he did. And I was told if I get phone calls like this because I might get it, I should just hang up. So I said, I know who you are, and I hung up. Then he called back again a few days later. And when I answered the phone, he was screaming as soon as I answered the phone. I read all your books. You are lying about everything, even about your mother. There was no Auschwitz. There were no Holocaust chambers. There were no gas chambers. When he said, I'm lying about my mother, it got to me. In 1942, in the ghetto of Lodz, there was a high room Kosky, a Jew that was put in charge of keeping the connection between the ghetto and the Nazis. And uh, whatever he needed, he would come, all the speech. So he came together, and with tears in his eyes, he would say, Breeder and Schwester, brothers and sisters, give me your children. My kid is, you give me your children. He says, a terrible thing happened. 
the Nazis won 10,000 of our best, our children. Why? Because the children are useless, they can't walk. So we will take those children, send them away to places where they could walk. He didn't tell us the truth where he's going to stay. We're going to get, send them to schools, and we're going to send them to hospitals if they need it, and to give them easy jobs, and bring it to the ghetto of large people from other ghettos that could work. Please give me your children. Of course, we didn't want to give the children. Though I was a lot, all thought a little bit about a child I was taking. No, at that time I was only 60, 42. And we decided not to give the children and go into hiding. So uh, the ghetto was surrounded by Nazis, came in with guards, with weapons, and Jewish police. And the Jewish police I will not defend it, but we can't judge them. They were given lists of people that they have to go and bring into the deportation centers. And they were told, if you don't bring the people on that list, we'll take your children, your wives, your families. Do you know what you would have done under those circumstances? No. You can't judge if you own those shoes. That's why I say, I, I won't defend you, but I, I can't judge you. But they were there helping to find the people who were hiding. <sighs> and they were going around from house to house, screaming, you knew I was Jews out. I had a little brother in the ghetto. I was with my mother and three young brothers. Bible had tuberculosis. And Mama said, I'm not bringing light aloud. I don't trust in what they say. So we lived on the ground floor, and there was a root cellar, actually a hole in the ground where you kept vegetables and potatoes and coal. It was empty now, there were no potatoes, or call or anything to keep there. So we put blankets and pillows, we put libel in there, and there was a trapdoor. We closed the trapdoor and we put a table over it, showing that he's going to be sick. And I pleaded with Mama, she should hide with libel. And she said, no. First of all, I'm not sick, and I'm not old, and she had good walking papers. She had says that she is needed, so she felt safe. And uh, besides, she said, my mother was a widow, and had three older children escaped before the wolves to get up escaped to Russia. So she said, oh, oh, I have a widow with four young children. What are they going to do to me? No, it's safe to go out. And we went out of the gate. And when she went out, she saw a guard looking in the house. And she thought she's going to go Search and find a Bible. She turned pale. And once her bed sentence. And they took her away. And at that time, we didn't know where they were taking her, but we found out later to take her to a place called Helno. In Helno, they had experimental gas chambers. They had talks with the Red Cross emblem, and the people were told that they're going in Easter Red Cross, 
they gone in for physical examination to see what work they could do. And as soon as they went into the trucks, they locked them in pump packed in gas. And those were the experimental gas chambers. And that was fast enough for them, so they built Auschwitz with more water than gas chambers. We didn't know it at that time when we just, I never saw my mother again. But I found out later, the hard way, what happened to those who were taken away from the camp in 1942. So now, at the Holocaust deniers telling me I'm alive, I make up a story of a Holocaust that never occurred, it never happened. So what happened to my family? Why my grandchildren? My, my children never had grandparents. Why did they have to go up with our grandparents? Why are they afraid to ask questions? I have a lot of boys. In the ghetto, I also learned that goodness could survive evil. Compassion could survive evil. We can't destroy everything in anybody. If you don't let it destroy it, they won't destroy it. My little brothers, why the leg in and I was 16 at the time, I became the legal guardian after my mother was taken away. And uh, well, he, Libelo was sick with tuberculosis. And I became sick from malnutrition. So I, I couldn't walk, I had to stay in one bed, and Libelo in the other bed. There were no doctors, and the doctors would like that there's nothing they could have done for you. But everybody had to walk in the factory to get to get a bowl of soup. So Lila and I could not work. So we stayed in bed, two separate beds. I was telling him stories from literature and school, what I had learned. And that that was the entertainment. And then Model and Moisha that jobs in the factory, they taught him how to use a sewing machine. The sewing machine was bigger than they were small children. The sewing machine, they, they could hardly reach it, but they would get the bowl of soup. Now, we were starving, literally starving. I don't know why we say, oh, I'm starving. You don't know what's starving. I hope you never know what starving is. They were starving. And here they got the bowl of soup and had the metal cans carried on their shoulders where they put in the soup there. And most of the people who do that lunch bread would quickly eat the soup and it didn't taste, take long to eat it. They were all dying from hunger. But Motala and Lively, Motala and Moshele, save their soup for Lively and me to bring it home and add water and Share it with us. This, this, uh, you have to know what one hunger feels like. They're able to understand how much of a sacrifice it was. One day they sold the rational bread. We, we, we couldn't sell it. We, I know, exchange it, trade it. And I didn't know what they did, but you know, I was laying in bed. They came back, I'm sure you read it in the book. <laughs> and Boshua said, open your mouth, Riva. Riva is my Yiddish name. And I what a hand game are we playing? Don't you trust us young know, children? I opened my mouth. And they put a piece of tangerine in my mouth. They traded the Russian bread to get one to dream, assuming that it will make me well, that I'll be able to walk again. They took physical, emotional, all different powers to be able to do that. That's what I mean, that good could also survive under bad circumstances. 
we had secret classes. We had secret a secret library in our house. It was for another elderly couple. At, at that time, all the army was the elderly. Then, then they were elderly because I was a child. There must have been a difference. And to us, they, at that time, they were elderly. And they decided it's too risky to hold out those books to hide. They killed you for one book, they killed you for three hundred. So whatever book it was, not didn't make any difference what the book is, what the topic is. It's a book. And we hid in our house books which survived. The readers did be for the books survived. The secret classes. Why did we study? Why did we learn a subject that really didn't have the strength to do at that moment? Why was it important? I kept on remembering what my mother used to say. We used to, we used to study, we used to learn, we used to build a new tomorrow. So we wanted to be prepared for mama comes back, when siblings come back. And then if you hold on to something, it gives you hope, it gives you reason to, to work for. If if we would say to ourselves, um, you're going to survive anyway. Why do all those things? Why risking your life in books? Why studying? You give up quickly. You know that sometimes when you wake up and you're in a down mood, you don't feel like anything is worthwhile. What if we say yourself is tomorrow and I have to find the strength to do it, to hold up, I could do it. You do it. And that's how we held up our life. Living one more day, day was resistance. Holding on to life was showing defiance. And we tried to hold up to life as long as long as we could. And then in 1944, people, Hans people. The head of the Nazi commandant, whatever his business was, he was the commandant. He came to the ghetto, dressed in civilian clothes, and standing in front of each ghetto. The ghetto was one huge factory, especially the large ghetto. And he was standing there as a minor youth. My Jews, I know that you don't know what's going on outside of the ghetto. But the Russians are there also, and we would like to save our labor. In so far, we're going to resettle you to other places so you could continue to, to work for us. You know, the hair is going to be touched on your head. Families, please stay together. Take whatever is of value to you. And please stay together. And he closed the factories. That means we're not useful anymore. And if we're not useful, we can't stay together. And the major meal, the soup, is be gone. So if you look at pictures, seeing people going to cattle cars, where well, you don't know that they're going to cattle cars, people marching with stuff on your, their shoulders, they didn't know what it was wrong. They wanted to believe what he said, now the hair is going to be touched on your head. They were being marched away, we didn't know that time, we found out later before they were being marched. At that time, we didn't know what, what was going on. And Mortala, Michael by that time had died. And Mortala and Moshe and I decided we'll hide in the same hole of the ground with some other friends. And we ran out of food. The ghetto was getting smaller. It was easy to be caught. 
And then we too held on to that straw. If you want to convince yourself, you could convince yourself of anything. Oh, maybe he's telling the truth. Maybe they need our maybe they're moving us to end. Take whatever's up on you. You go to the, he didn't say cattle cars, to the trains. What was of value to me was I wrote letters, called it letters. I wrote, there was no post office, we couldn't mail anything, couldn't receive anything. Letters to my siblings and to my mother, always believing that everybody's going to come back. Telling them what is happening and what are we doing and what we are not doing. If, when they come back, and if we hear, you could tell. But still, if we're not here, and they come back, they'll read those letters. So I took those letters and the picture of my mother, and we went to the train station. And then what we saw, the catacombs. I was in a Holocaust museum in Washington several times. And then one day I was addressing a group of 200 English teachers. And then I had a book signing, but I told them that I want to go upstairs, I want to see the cattle car, and I want to see the mountains of hay and shoots upstairs. Two ladies took me upstairs. And when I came to one of the, there was one cattle car there on display. I looked at it. That's it? A little box like this have 80 people inside that box? And I was standing there touching the walls like I was trying to find someone here hiding inside those walls. And then I looked at the mountains of the hair and on the shoes and I could feel my hair being shaped. <sighs> when I came into the kettle car and lodge, I was there with my brothers, squashed together, and they kept on pleading, hold on to life. We'll find each other again. And there were some people screaming that they see nightmares, they see fires. Maybe it was in the head, they couldn't see it. But eventually when we came, after three days, not knowing where we are and where we go and squash to get it. We arrived at a place we didn't know existed. Auschwitz, she was the Polish name for Auschwitz. And when they opened the catacombs, there were a lot of people that had died. And we were greeted. At that time, we didn't know who it was. A very elegant officer saying, links swept left, right, left, right. But later we learned it was Dr. Mengelis. He was waiting for every transport to take, especially twins, for medical experiments. And when they opened it, there was music play. Why music? They added the confusion. They had very talented musicians from all different countries. And they had a folk, they were playing for their lives. They had to play it for every transport when they arrived, they had to be confused. And there were people in striped uniform, which we never saw striped uniform, we didn't know who they were. They were running around among the people, and in Yiddish telling them, twins don't stay together, mothers give your children to grandma. Why? 
We were all too confused, too much in shock to, to, to ask any people. But we found out later that the twins, they knew that Mangalas is looking for twins. And the children, to give them to grandma, because the grandmas and the children were sent to the left. At the time, again, we didn't know what left means for right wing. And the able-bodied people went to the right. The people to the left were sent to the gift chambers. The man and the woman were separated, and that's the last time I saw Matala in Washington. It was still search for them, yes. I keep getting letters from different places where they have agencies that try to reunite families all over the world. Well, I do get answers, but the answers are only the information that I supplied, nothing else. But I still keep searching. I know it's tragic when you lose somebody. But when you have a grave, at least, you could scream, you could get angry, you could yell. But you know, that's it. But if you have no grave, you hold up to false hopes. Many times, even in later years, survivors will Stop somebody, he sounded familiar, the name sounds familiar, your voice sounds familiar, only to find out it's a mistake. You keep on searching, even if you know it doesn't make sense. I just don't know. I was the lucky one when I came to Auschwitz, I was sent to the right. I was 18 years old by that time. So they had us marched naked to see if there's still flesh bone that could be used for work. And they had pipes that would come look over the merchandise. There's a sign which is still there in Auschwitz. Arbeit macht frei, which work makes you free. And they would tell us the two ways out from Auschwitz. Either to the gas chambers, it means you're going to be killed. Or slave labor, it be sold. So as a lucky one, I was sold after a week to a factory that was making rubber washers for airplanes in a place in the middle Stein. In such a small world, last year my granddaughter received an email message from somebody in Poland asking her on Facebook. She saw that she was wishing her grandmother a happy birthday. And the grandma's name was Ruth Mensky Sennett. If she is my grandchild, can she get in touch with me? And my granddaughter had called me and said, well, give her my email. And then I got the letter from, no, an email from the letter from Poland. She was a medical student in Mittelstein. That's the place where the concentration camp was, the slave labor camp. And she says she read a cage in English in Poland. And she lives in Mittelstein. She was born in Mittelstein. After the war, Poland and Germany did some trading. And some Poles settled in those former Germans. The Europe is always, you don't know which country you're going to be on in the next few years. This became Poland, and her grandmother settled there. 
So her mother was born in Mittelsteine, and she was born in Mittelsteine. And when she read the cage, she started screaming, we live next door to the camp. The camp is there anymore, just an empty space. So she wanted to get in touch with me to tell me that she lives near the place that used to be the camp of Mittelsteine. We were sent there 400 girls. They didn't give us numbers in Auschwitz. What they did, did the people who would send, what we came in is Birkenau, which was the transit camp, what they called, of Auschwitz. In the guest chambers went Birkenau. In the other part, the Auschwitz part, the slave labor camp came. So if they admitted you to the slave labor camp, they gave you a tattooed number. The ones for the guest chambers, they didn't tattoo, they didn't bother with anything. And the ones that being sold were sent away without numbers. The numbers were given to us in the camps that they were sold to. And we were giving numbers to what we're standing. I was five, five, all aged. And we were ordered to forget our names. Remember your number. Now here we were dressed in rags. We had all shoes, the same shoes. I found Fernanda survivors, they all had the same shoes. Wooden bottoms in rough canvas tops. No socks. And I was literally pulling this skin off. Their heads were shaved, dressed in rags, those wooden shoes. And to take away, take away the little scrap of dignity, we became numbers. In order, if you forget your name, you have to forget your name. You to, if you forget your number, all 400 of you will be punished. You were always responsible. <laughs> And they put us in barracks, 50 people in one barrack. There were three layers of wooden plank beds with a second straw and a blanket. And at night there were buckets. We weren't allowed to leave the barrack, the outhouse. Back in the week, just toilet. And in the morning, it was a beautiful mountain area. At five o'clock in the morning, they made us stay outside, shivering for cold. In country, if anybody died, if anybody escaped, there was no way escaping. And then they marched us to the factory. And when we came to the factory, we were looking for chimneys. Only a short time ago, we didn't know what chimneys mean, what they stand for here. Now we knew. They were on chimneys because they were using electric drills. And as we walked into the factory, there were German form. <coughs> and in German, he was giving instructions explaining the machines, there were drills on very high pedestals. And he was giving instructions how to use it. And if you make a mistake, it's sabotage. You're all responsible for one another. When he came to me, he looked at me and he said, how old are you, little girl? I was 80. And I said so, and he said, no, no, you're only 14. And besides, you can't reach the machine, which was true. I couldn't reach the machine with that pedestal going. He didn't know that I couldn't see the machine because I had glasses when I came to Auschwitz. And when we came to Auschwitz, we had to strip our clothes. Well, if you had hearing aids and glasses or whatever, anything you had on you, you had to stay stuck naked. And then they shaved the heads. 
Now I put this here and don't bless it. He didn't know it. Reject. As I reject, I was sent to the corner with some other girls this day. <clears throat> For whatever reason, they were rejected. And we taught that this is a death sentence because we learned quickly if, if you're useless, according to them, you have no right to live. And we went into a pitch dark tunnel. Assuming that they're going to shoot us there. We had no place to run, we had no place to go, so we just walked in. But then we heard somebody speaking German with a French accent. And he said, Mademoiselle, you're not going to be killed here. I guess he knew what was going on in our heads. He said, my comrades and I are French prisoners of war. We are digging a tunnel, a bomb shelter for the Germans, not for us. And you, if you feel beside, behind you, there are buckets. We put the dirt inside the buckets and you want a chain. You pass the buckets from one to the other until you get it out and this is your job. And he started singing the Marcel Gates, which is a song of resistance known in Europe and all languages. And we started singing with him. A little while ago we thought we were being shot and now we're singing. And the guard opened the door, the door. whatever was separated us from the outside. And she started screaming, you stopped it all coming. What would you do? We stopped. At one point, I cut my hand against those buckets, the Wagorski. We had no doctors. We had one medical student, Anna, from Budapest. And she was as close as we came to having a doctor. But you weren't allowed to be sick only for three days. You could go into the sick room, which was a little room with mattresses, straw sacks, not mattresses, straw sacks on the floor, and a blanket. And uh, after three days, if you didn't get better, they sent you to the Rolls which is the Auschwitz, was the Auschwitz at the end. And the doctor, she had nothing to walk with. She would only give you a compress, a cold compress, or a hug. I'll give you some loving words of encouragement. Hold on, don't give up. Before I got sick, as we were leaving the underground stove, that's what they call it, the underground shelter that we were building, I asked, we weren't supposed to talk to each other, but naturally we were running because always we were always being chased. We were running and kind of trying to exchange some information. And I asked one of the girls next to me, she told me she was from Lodge too. And I asked, did you hear anything? Did you see anything? As we, if they, they had German newspapers laying on their desks, and we could read German. She says, no, I didn't see anything, I didn't hear anything, but the foreman did a courageous thing. He put something in my pocket. He, he put a brown bag, wrapped. she could feel that there was bread in the bag. He would have been punished for it. He wouldn't have been killed, but he would have been punished for it. And I 
She said, I'm saving the bread for my sister. She was one of the lucky ones that she had a sister. Most of us had not. She says, my sister is weak here. I'm the strong one. So I'm saving it for her. That took a lot of strength, devotion, courage. You're dying from hunger, and here you have a piece of bread in your pocket. You're risking punishment for everybody if they find it, but she's keeping it for her sister. And I said, what are you going to do with the brown bag? She thought I was crazy. You can't eat your brown bag, what difference does it make? And I told her that I used to write since I was 10 years old. Poetry and stories. And if I had paper, I would want to write poetry. She thought I was crazy. And in the year you want to write poetry. And then you'd have no pencil either way. But she gave me the brown bag. And at another point, as he was standing outside, we had silent pill head count twice a day. As we were standing there being counted, she put in my hand a little stub of a pencil. And I said, where'd you get it? What did you do? Because everything meant punishment. She said, I took it from the foreman's table. And God will have to forgive me. I broke a commandment, I stole. There's some values, hold on, stay with you. And I started writing poetry. The girls would, everything was considered stealing. They were searching in the garbage, risking punishment, the pieces of paper. And I would write poetry, poetry of hope, poetry of pain, and read it to the girls. And as long as they listen to it, we all had something to hold on to. We held on to hope. Those poems were just published by Yad Vashem a few months ago. It's called While There Is Life. And when I look at those poems, they survived and I survived. We had no chance of survival at that point. But they survived to bear witness. And when I look at those poems, is it where did I feel? How could I feel at that moment when I look back? I wrote how I felt and what I saw. And they're very powerful. And those poems saved me. The poems in the Nazi Commandant. You remember in the book how vicious she was, even more vicious. But I was afraid when I was writing it. If I tell exactly how it was, how vicious, people will think that I exaggerated. It couldn't be. We don't know what could be. And when I got, I cut my hand against it, bark it, it got blood poisoning. And Anna tried to perform surgery. She had nothing to walk with, and got green set. She had courage, a husband. She went to the commandant. He said, there's a girl in the river by the name. She's 19 years old. She writes poetry. Now, uh -huh. this is a crime. Where she get a paper, where she get a pencil, and then when me, she put poetry. She said she writes poetry, and it's poetry of hope. And she reads it to the girls. And as long as the girls, she didn't say what they 
And as long as the girls hold out the hope, you have a factory, you have a camp. The guards had their own boogeyman. They were afraid of the Russian front. So she said to the commandant, if, this, if the girls can't work, the camp will fall apart, and you're going to be sent to the Russian front. That took a lot of courage to say it. Somehow, I don't know what, what touched the commandant, what happened to her. But she, Anna said she has to be sent to her hospital. And she called, the commandant called one of her guards and told them to take me to a hospital in the town of Mutglatz, a nice little mountain town. They got me all dressed up because I was born into a German town. First of all, they covered my head. I was cold. They covered with this striped head where they got it, I don't know. And they put on the nicest coat they could find. Or they put the number in the star of David on my coat. It was quite visible who I am. And as we were going to the train, we had to walk a long way to the train. <clears throat> That God was just me and God. And I guess when she was alone, she became human. Because she asked me, what's your name? We were parasites to them. Yeah, she asked what her name. I said to Reba, what happened to your family? And I held out to the hope that they're alive someplace. Just as I am in a camp, then another camp. And I said so. And she looked at me and she said, As took me the line, it pains me. And she knew that it's not what I think is happening. She knew more. But she expressed sorrow as to the line. And we went on a train, and the people were looking at me like some sort of a monster. There were empty seats, but I didn't dare sit on the seat, so I sat on the floor. And when we came to class, Jews were not allowed on the sidewalk for the Nuremberg laws, and this was already a long time into those laws. So I had to walk in the garden, and I couldn't see. I had no glasses, and I had high temperature, and I was in pain. So she walked behind me in the garden and kept on the notch, please, I wouldn't fall. And of course, everybody beside her was staring. They, they knew what's going on there. Eh? And we went to from one hospital to the other. And a very handsome doctor, she told him my Heftling, the prisoner, my prisoner is dying. She died without medical help. And he looked at her and said, my dear lady, our German boys are also dying. We do not treat Jews. And they physically threw the two of us out. And she went from hospital to hospital, all hospitals. I was ready to give up. I knew I was, I'm alone and I'm dying. But she didn't. And lots of times I think Peggy said maybe she was insulted. Here she was in uniform with her prisoner and they threw her out. Or maybe we came here. She found a doctor, a woman doctor, who whispered to her, wait until I'm finished with what I'm doing with my patients. I'll look at her. And she put me out and performed surgery. My head, there's a big scar from the top to the finger across all my hand. When I go like this, my finger doesn't move because the nerve is cut. But the hand is here, and like I said before, I signed my books with that hand. That was supposed to be here. <laughs> so that commandant, willing or not willing, it saved my life. 
I did one and while I allowed three days of sickness, she kept me actually hidden for six weeks, protecting me. And when inspectors would come, she would be in another room. She put in sugars because I had no medicines. So she did do whatever she could to keep me alive. And then it was Christmas time and the factories was closed and the guards were bored. They always looked for entertainment. We were the entertainment. So the Anna, our, we called the doctor, came into the sick room and said, the, we have to put on a show for them to keep them calm. Can I recite some of my poems? in Yiddish, similar to German. So I recited two poems. One, the show, the underground shelter, what they're doing, and the day will come, we'll take revenge. And the guards looked around, you know, and the girls would turn green because they understood his punishment. But the commandant didn't say anything. And then I recited my poem, A Message to Mama, using the clouds as my messages, sending a message of hope. I fainted afterwards. And they took me back to the sick room. And the commandant chased after me. And the girl thought that she's going to punish me. And she came in and just stood there in her uniform with her hands in her pockets. They said, what should I do with you? Who am I to tell her what to do? And then she says, I taught. We killed all the emotions in you. All you could feel is hunger. She didn't know what hunger felt like. And all you could think of is fresh. It's a good word of saying stuff in your stomach. But here you still send a message of hope to your mother. And she remembered it's Christmas time that she has a mother. And she took out from her pocket a little notebook. He said, here, you could write your poems in it. And those were the poems. I still have those booklets to survive with me. First, I wrote on scraps of paper. But when she gave me the booklet, and later sent in another one, I rewrote it inside the booklets, because it was easier to hide. The booklets survived with me in this, my new book. We were liberated by sheer miracles. Every time we would hear the sound of bombs, we would rejoice. In fact, one of the poems there, I'm telling about the joy we heard the sound of bombs. And they would say, by day I mean the Nazis, don't rejoice, the day before we die, you'll die. And they kept the wood. Thousands and thousands of survivors died in those moments. And said so using the trains to move the soldiers to move whatever they needed to do, they would fill them with survivors, taking out of the camps, like the camps, like the trains, and let the trains run until the trading people were killed. They did everything to keep the wood. And we were being marched, not knowing where we going. And this one of a guard came along and started screaming, the Russians are right behind us. And they had orders, they had orders to shoot us. Put us into the woods, not to make dirt in the town. 
and uh, they argued, we could hear them arguing, they wanted to follow the orders. Well, I'm glad that they didn't succeed because otherwise I wouldn't be here. And as my grandchildren said, you wouldn't have been here, your parents wouldn't have been here, and we wouldn't have been here, and the other generations wouldn't have been here. And this is the revenge. We survived. We have new generations, and we have to remember what hate and prejudice and indifference leads to. Not let this happen to any people, any place in the world. I want to share with you one of my poems. Why? I wrote it. February 14, 1945, it's 90 years old. I was, which means why, and I didn't get to learn the word. I was, all alone. I stared at the window, feeling my soul in me cry. Hearing the painful screams of my heart, Calling silently, why? Why are your dreams scattered, destroyed? Why are you put in this cage? Why is the world silently watching? Why continue your rage? Why is the barbed wire holding you prisoner? Blocking the freedom, my way. Why do I still keep waiting, hoping, dreaming, maybe, someday? I see above me snow-covered mountains, majestic, proud, and high. If like a free bird, I could reach the peaks, maybe from day and the world would hear my cry. Why? Please don't stop asking why. Thank you. survived, but the readers didn't, but the book survived. Lots of great messages tonight, and I hope that you know that when you leave Hampton Bays, your story survives. And it's clear that when you come to speak, the risks that you took, the pain that you endured, you relive it again and again as you tell these stories for us to live. We believe in the living classroom, in Hampton Bays. We believe that the living classroom and the living story and the living history is more important than the internet and Facebook and our textbooks. And it's an understatement to say that when the 600 people leave this room and those watching on the internet right now, uh, when we leave tonight, I promise you we will take your story with you, with us, and do good to be an honor to be somebody who helps to be you. Since we believe in the living history, we want to share with you a humble thank you and a humble gift of the Hampton Bay's history over the last hundred years in our small community. We thank you for being here and sharing your story and inspiring us to do so, to do something good tomorrow. Thank you.
beginning of tonight's uh, speech, I posted on our school's Facebook, and at dinner last night, I mentioned to Mrs. Clemson uh, that Ruth Minsky Sender was coming, and I, and I see some retired faculty members here. This is not the first time you've been to Hampton Bays, and we welcome you back. I've seen pictures of your signed books from 1996, 1997, 1998. Hampton Bays is always home for you. We hope you'll come back again. Thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you to our faculty members who will make sure that the story and the work continues in the classroom tomorrow. Have a great night. Thank <laughs> you.